Hey, do you believe in God? If you do, get ready to squirm. Or maybe scream, because your biggest nightmare is right here. Richard Dawkins, king of the atheists. The guy they call Darwin's Rottweiler. It is irrational to allow your life to be governed by something other than evidence. Darwinism does provide the answer to these profound questions. Spoken like a true scientist, which makes sense, because that's what Dawkins is. But do you know how he became one? Well, believe it or not, this guy at one point did believe in God. He was brought up Anglican, but stopped believing in his mid-teens. Why, you ask? Well, he discovered Charles Darwin and evolution. Dawkins ended up studying zoology at Oxford and got his PhD. Ten years later, he made a bit of a splash. If you were around in 1976, maybe you remember the selfish gene. That was Dawkins' take on Darwin's theory of natural selection. Don't know it? Well, how about this one? The God delusion. That's the one where Dawkins says that God almost certainly does not exist. And that people who believe blindly in a supreme being are, well, delusional. I think it's pathetic. And I think, I think it's, it's something that we ought to have grown out of. Pretty harsh stuff. So harsh, in fact, that Dawkins' friends and literary agent wouldn't let him write it for six years until atheism had become more mainstream. Now Dawkins is at it again with a new book called The Greatest Show on Earth. We can't see evolution happening because we don't live long enough. We look at the clues that remain and they all overwhelmingly point to the same conclusion. Evolution is a fact. Please welcome back Richard Dawkins. How are you? Fine, fine. That is, a, uh, that is a lovely tie. That's my Galapagos tie, <laughs> uh, one of my ties hand-painted by my wife. This is a one-off unique, unique tie. Did, did you come home one day and she had doodled on your tie, or was that always part of the plan? This was a present, and she spent <laughs> hours and hours slaving over this, not a doodle. Not at all. <laughs> no. uh, and, well, the Galapagos Island, I mean, that is a significant, yeah. significant for Charles Darwin. It was one of the formative places that he visited. He didn't get the idea straight away from that. It came afterwards. He collected specimens from Galapagos, and then later, when he got back to England and the specimens were identified and classified in London in the museums, he then got the idea there's something funny going on here. These animals are all kind of like South American animals, but not exactly, and yeah. um, so he worked out that what had happened was that some kind of freak events had blown animals across or drifted across, they'd got to the islands, very unusual thing to happen, and then they started evolving when they got there. And then they, a slightly less freakish event would dr drive them across to other islands within the archipelago. So within the archipelago, they're kind of much more similar than they are to the ones on the mainland. Everything, as it just said on the film clip, everything is exactly as you would expect if they'd evolved. Well, you've actually taken on some of the language of, of, of the Bill O'Reilly types by referring to people who deny evolution as history deniers, well, which I, I chuckled at when I read yeah, that. I, I didn't think that was Bill O'Reilly language. I mean, it, it's, it's simply the literal truth. I mean, history deniers, they are denying history, just like Holocaust deniers are denying history. Yeah, you said that in the book, and, and, and I mean, obviously it's provocative language. Uh, and Not to me it wasn't. It only occurred to me it was provocative after the book was published and people picked, <laughs> picked up on it. Yeah. And, so you, and so you just look at it like there's, there's enough evidence to, to support, um, as, an, as much evidence to support evolution as there was something like the Holocaust. Or exactly. The, the, there's at least as much evidence to support evolution as to, as to support the Holocaust. I had a, a guy that I, uh, that I know said, if you want proof that, that no higher power created humans, he said, look at the human shoulder. It's so poorly designed. That, that there's just no way that a higher being would be that dumb I <laughs> to get the shoulder wrong. The I'm, I'm in pain in my right shoulder at the right. moment. And yeah. The thing, though, uh, about it is that can this book exist beside religious texts? Does it have to exist on top of religious texts? Because if you're right, if you're right and you have that science in your mind to prove this, um, then who cares what people believe? Well, I care a lot because I think it's such an exciting thing. I mean, I think, I think that, the, that the, the, the fact that we exist because of natural selection, the fact that we are cousins of every living creature in the world, the fact that our history goes back nearly four billion years, that's an astounding, enthralling, inspiring fact. And I, and I care whether people get that. So in a sense, if, by denying uh, evolution, it's missing the point of how beautiful the universe can be. Precisely. It's like, it, to deny that would be like never, never listening to music, never seeing any art, never seeing a beautiful sunset. It's part of the beauty of existence. When did that song ring true to you? When did you have a moment you went, that sings to me? I guess about 16. Uh, See, but I, I read Jim Morrison. I, I read the Jim Morrison book. What, what did you read at 16 that got you there? No, it was 
I think it was talking to my father, really, who told me about, about it. And, and a rather inspiring biology teacher as well. And you sort of said, this is how beautiful evolution can be. No, they didn't use quite that language. No, I mean, I could have came to that later. As you take this, uh, as you take this book and these stories across Europe now, are you received differently after the God delusion? Yes, I mean, I think that uh, there are people who assume that this must be another atheistic book. Mm -hmm. It's an anti-creationist book, it's a pro-evolution book, but there's nothing in it that should bother a clergyman who um, is a, well, a sort of well-educated clergyman who necessarily accepts the evidence for evolution, because you can't be well-educated and not accept the evidence for evolution. Are you, finding that, is, are you finding that as time goes on, though, that you're able to reach more and more people? Yes, I think so. I've got to be optimistic about that. I think the Internet is enormously helpful. It's completely changed the way humans conduct their affairs, and you can get a, such a feeling for the buzz that's going around the whole of, of human life. You, you've been this guy, and I wondered if it ever wears on you, the fact that, you, you know, we, we sort of joked about the, the Pope of Atheism in, in the bio. We referred to you as a, other people called you Darwin's Rottweiler, which is also kind of a funny title. Um, well, I'm rather a gentle soul, really. I mean, I don't, I don't really... <laughs> I don't feel like a Rottweiler. Um, I, I think a lot of it is that people have read that I'm aggressive mm -hmm. and that I'm strident and that I'm shrill. And they've never actually read anything I've written. They've never actually heard me speak. But they've seen propaganda, which is what it amounts to, I mean, saying that I'm strident and aggressive and shrill. And you know, one of the challenges, I think, for, for doing what you do is that the Bible is actually written rather simply in that parables explain realities. When you're trying to, to explain evolution to people, you know, and, and maybe perhaps open their minds to certain things. It's very difficult to do that in, in scientific terms and then make it easy for people to understand. Is that something you're aware of when you sit it's down? Not, it's nothing like as difficult as some physics. I mean, it's like, not difficult like quantum physics or right. relativity. Um, there are stumbling blocks. One stumbling block is the sheer length of time it takes. Because we're familiar with the idea that you can change a little bit. You can breed um, pigeons. Uh, D Darwin is very interested in breeding pigeons. Mm -hmm. You breed pigeons and that takes a few centuries. Uh, if you imagine the amount of difference between pigeons in a couple of centuries and then extrapolate that to 100 million years, 200 million years, the human mind has no grasp of what a million years is, let alone 100 million years. is. You just can't get your head around that. And it's important to try to do so because otherwise you don't understand how you can go from a fish to a human. Mm -hmm. But you've got a hell of a lot of time in order to do that. When you think of what's been achieved in a few centuries with pigeons or dogs or cattle or, or um, cauliflowers. <laughs> the thing, I, when I went through the book and I read The God Delusion as well, and I, I've talked to people who are you know, religious people, you know, and there's the, some who just quickly dismiss what you write and others who are far more open to it. I always wondered about getting through the night and how does evolution get people through the night? And that just seems to be one of the big reasons why people connect to a religion is the fact that there is more to life than just this. There's no obligation on anything to get you through the night. If you can't get through the night, that's tough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, do it doesn't follow that because something gets you through the night, it's true. Right. It would be nice if it was, <laughs> but what's nice isn't necessarily what's there. Right. Um, however, um, I don't find it difficult to get through the night. I mean, I, I find the, the privilege of existence, the fact that I'm here, and the odds against my being here and you, your being here are just astronomical and Absolutely. staggering. Um, so we are very, very lucky to be here. We won't be here forever. Let's make the most of it, and, and let's enjoy life. Let's take an interest in life. Let's appreciate life, and that's what gets us through the night. I wonder if you walk down the street, though, because, because your books are so influential now to a group of people that there are enough parents out there who don't subscribe to what you believe in who, are, who really are challenged by what you do. It used to be they were afraid of Metallica. Now they're afraid of you. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's um, interesting. Um, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know whether that's, that's really true. Oh, it's um, true. I, 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 it's absolutely true because you're challenging. Uh, what happens is you arm the kids to go home and have conversations with their parents in a way they wouldn't otherwise be armed. Oh, I can't be sorry about that. I mean, that's got to be a good thing, hasn't it? It really has. Certainly. If, if, I, if I'm arming children to go and, and argue with their parents, oh, what could be better than that? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we talked to Richard Dawkins, the author, and just stick around up next. Uh, Doctor Who is fictional. We know that, right? And you should know that. <laughs> Doctor Who is not real. I don't know how many people get to go on Doctor Who, a science fiction television show, and do a cameo as themselves. You get to be yourself on Doctor Who. 
The Simpsons is my great ambition. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> That'd be a pretty good one. Um, no, I, I was on Doctor Who because my wife used to be on it, and, and so I guess that was why they thought it was interesting. Did you grow up watching that show? No, I didn't. Um, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I've watched all her tapes since. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a guilty pleasure television show? Do you sit back and watch, like, Flavor of Love or something like that? Um, Do you have one? I've never heard of that one. Yeah. Um, You're not missing anything, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, well, I love The West Wing. Yeah. Um, ER. Uh... Yeah. How about a favorite movie? You have a favorite movie? Oh well, old British comedies like the Lady Killers, the real Lady Killers, not the, the ridiculous one, one that they made up recently. Yeah, the, the American one, the, the the real British Lady Killers. Is Who's it? your favorite world leader of all time? Barack Obama. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, what is it about Obama that you like so oh, much? I mean, a wonderful leader, a, 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 such a breath of a breath of fresh air after the appalling uh, debacle of the last eight years. <laughs> Um, intelligent, eloquent, uh, sympathetic, thoughtful, and um, really interested in getting the right things done. What's the one song that if it comes on the radio, you're certainly going to turn it up in the car and you're going to start moving your head? Oh, my God, these questions. Um, <laughs> well, because we already know about how you think about this other stuff. We need to understand Dawkins the man. Um, yeah, okay. I love sort of Judy Collins type Joan Baez uh, type um, folk songs. Mellow, thoughtful. Y yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes perfect sense. I mean, you were a Vietnam War protester, weren't you? Yes. What kind of protester were you? Yeah, I mean, I, I was in Berkeley, California in the late 60s, and that was the place to be if you want to get involved with that kind of protest. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, we had tear gas and National Guard with flowers stuffed in their end of their rifles and things like that. What was that time like? Well, it was, in, it was an exciting time. It was a bit distracting from the sort of work that I was supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, is, uh, is Bill O'Reilly as thoughtful, fair-minded, and kind as he seems on oh, TV? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard's um, got a brand new book. It's called The Greatest Show on Earth, The Evidence for Evolution. Uh, good to have you on the show. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.